But Genesis 50 is where we'll be today, starting in verse 14, and the title of our message, Living and Finishing Well. Great lessons for our life to be strengthened in our faith and to live well and to finish well before the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we open our hearts even as we open the word of God. Meet us here by your Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit of life through your word. Show us the life that you would have us to live, the way to live that gives honor to your name and blesses the steps of our lives. We look to you tonight in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Genesis 50 really centers on Joseph. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I don't know, you probably have your favorites as well, but Joseph is one of my favorites because they're so much we can learn. So many life lessons uh, from the example of his life. But perhaps the greatest is how to live well and how to finish well. How you live matters. The course of your life matters. And the decisions that you make that affect the course matter. And will therefore impact how you finish. See, as for me, I want to live well and I want to finish well. To the glory of God, how you live matters. I want to hear those words, well done, well lived, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Anybody else want to join me? Well done, well lived. But there are principles for living well. There are principles for finishing well that we can take hold of and apply to our lives. There are many examples uh, in the scriptures of those who lived well and finished well. Abraham tells us that when Abraham died uh, in Genesis 25, it says, he, uh, he died in a ripe old age, an old man, and satisfied with life. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to look back on your life and know that you lived it to the glory of God? No one's perfect. There there is no one among us who's perfect. But to live to the glory of God, to live well, to finish well. Um, There's Moses. It says in in, in Deuteronomy uh, 34, since those days, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Ah, there's something about that description. Moses and God were like friends, and they walked it together. They, there was a relationship. Remember, it was Moses who set up the tent of meeting outside the camp. And he said to Israel, anyone who wants to meet God, anytime you want, I set up a tent of meeting. You can go anytime you want. And Moses would regularly go out there to that tent. And it says that, I love this part. It says that whenever Moses went out of the camp to head for the tent of meeting to meet with God, it says that Israel stood on their feet. I just, this is a great scene to me. I don't know. The, all of Israel stood on their feet. And they watched Moses as he walked out to the tent of meeting. And it says that when Moses arrived at the tent of meeting, that the glory of God descended on that place. And that God and Moses, they spoke face to face like one would speak to his friend. That's such a beautiful relationship. And Jesus said, I do not call you servant, I call you friend. There's something beautiful about that relationship that God wants. Living well is the key to finishing well. You know, a tombstone often gives a sense of how a person lived their life. I've noticed that tombstones have become much simpler, perhaps because they're so much smaller. Back in the old, back in the old days, uh, they used to have really big tombstones, and people would light a, uh, write a lot of stuff on them, you know. And uh, a tombstone would, could give an insight into how that person lived. What would you like to have written on your tombstone? 
that reflects how you lived. These are some words written on actual tombstones when they had bigger ones. Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies stingy Jimmy Wyatt, who died one morning just at 10 and saved a dinner by it. Wouldn't you love to be known as stingy Jimmy? I don't know, but I think there's more to living than that. Amen. Then there's Jedediah Goodwin. He says, Jedediah Goodwin, auctioneer. <laughs> going, going, gone. And then I love this one. John Goimbel, attorney. The defense rests. <laughs> and this one, this one's a sad one. Here lies an atheist. All dressed up and no place to go. Actually, I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, I mean, the tombstone is true, but he's got, he's got a place to go. He's just not going to like it. Sorry for that, but that's true. But here's my favorite. See, I told you I was sick. Someone once said that the most important part of a tombstone is what lies behind the dash between the date of your birth and the date of your death. That's true. I want to show you a picture of perhaps one of the most amazing tombstones ever made. And this picture says it all. It was part of a slideshow that they played at the memorial service for Kyle Davidson just a couple of weeks ago. Kyle was born with an umbilical cord tied around or wrapped around his neck. And the result was brain damage that left him dependent on others' care all day, every day, for almost 15 years of his life. He passed away just a few weeks ago. But what an irrepressible spirit and an indomitable perseverance he had in facing life filled with difficulty. But he loved the Lord and he loved to worship and he delighted in God in his life. But the story is not complete until you hear about his parents, Mike and Laura. What, you want to see an example of a life well lived? It's right there. What faithful love, what loving servant's heart that took care of him all day, every day, and they said it was no burden, we loved him. And gave God glory all the way. And Laura would say she would share Jesus with every nurse and every doctor and every caregiver. And, and, and she just being the glory of God. There's something inspiring about seeing authentic, genuine faith lived out in relentless difficulty. To which we would say, well lived. Well done. What truly beautiful souls. Amen. Want to hear those words? Well done. Well lived. See, you turn to Genesis 50, and it's the story of Joseph. You want to talk about living through troubles, enduring faith through troubles. It was Joseph. The story unfolds. He was his father's favorite son, which made his brothers jealous. But more than that, Joseph had this dream that God would give him a place of position and authority that so much so that even his brothers would bow down to his great authority. And when he shared that dream with the brothers, they weren't very excited to hear it. In fact, in fact they didn't take kindly to it at all. And when an opportunity came to betray their brother Joseph, they took it and sold him uh, to be a slave in Egypt. There he was bought by one of the captains in Pharaoh's uh, command. And even there, the favor of God was on Joseph. But the troubles continued. Later, he was falsely accused by the wife of the master and found himself thrown into prison. But there, yet again, the favor of God was on him as he helped other prisoners through the gift of interpreting dreams. And then later, when the Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret, Joseph was called. Not only did Joseph interpret the dream, but he gave Pharaoh wisdom to prepare for the coming famine 
Seven years of terrible famine, which the dream indicated. Pharaoh then gave Joseph the position and responsibility to prepare Egypt for the great famine. There would be seven years of plenty, seven years of abundance, the dream indicated, followed by seven years of extreme famine. So he gave Joseph a position and authority. See, one of the things we need to see is that God's favor was seen in Joseph's life not in spite of the troubles and the difficulties that Joseph endured. No, God's favor was seen through the troubles. The valley of trouble was the very doorway by which God poured out his favor. It is a great principle of life. It was that terrible famine which brought Joseph's brothers to Egypt seeking grain to keep their families alive. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but they did not recognize him. But instead of carrying a grudge and seeking revenge, he blessed his brothers. There's a lot to the story. But Joseph's life and character makes us inspired to hold on and to have integrity, have faith in the midst of the battles of life, to live life well. When you live life to the glory of God, you will surely finish well and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's read the story of it, and then we'll look at the applications for it. Genesis 50, starting in verse 14, we're at the end here of his story. His father has recently passed away. His father was Jacob, also known as Israel. And uh, his father has passed away. And it says, after he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, uh, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did wrong. And now, they continued, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. When Joseph heard this, he wept. And he said to them, and he spoke, when they spoke to him, then his brothers also came and fell down before him, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Then his brothers also came. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. That, that verse right there is so important. Yes, you meant it for evil, but God meant it. God used it for good to bring about this great result to keep many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you, for you and for your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of his son Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Menkir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Manasseh was his son also. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God surely will take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from this place. In other words, do not leave my bones here in Egypt. I want my bones to be buried there in the land that God promised to my father, I want to be buried in the land of Israel. I love that part of the speech. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. 
Great story, great lessons for life. Starting with this, that God's way is the excellent way. When the brothers came back from burying their father, they said to themselves, what if Joseph should bear a grudge and pay us back in full for all the evil we did to him? See, they expected Joseph to be like so many other people, hurt, wounded, holding on, never let go, bitter, unforgiving. But that was not Joseph. There is a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 describes where Paul says, earnestly desire the greater gift, but I will show you that there is a still more excellent way to live. And then he brings them to chapter 13. Love is the more excellent way. Love is patient, love is kind. But the, the application, the choice that each one of us may, must make is to decide for yourself the course of which you will live. In other words, set your course by God's more excellent way. See, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, God's way is a more excellent way. It's a whole other thing to say, I want that way to be my way. I will set my course by God's more excellent way. You see, here's my point. There's a common way to live. I say common because most people live that way. But the common way is not God's way. God's ways are higher. And when you set your course by God's more excellent way, it will change the way you bear forth your life. Isaiah 55, for example, verses 7 and 9. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There is a higher way. There's a better way to live. The common average person lives the common average way. But God says, I will show you a more excellent way. Set the course of your life by that more excellent way. No one would have blamed Joseph for bearing a grudge, paying his brothers back for all the wrong they did to him because they deserved it. But Joseph lived by the more excellent way. Set your course. And when you live by the more excellent way, you will live well. 1 Corinthians 3 describes not living well. My brethren could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as like two infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you're still in the flesh. For since, is there not jealousy and strife? In other words, all kinds of bickering and arguing. Are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? He's bringing a pretty strong word to, to show them leading up to there's a better way. There's a more excellent way. Is there not bickering and jealousy and strife? You know, to use the words we've been learning from the Proverbs, any old fool can bicker. Any old fool can have strife, but it takes setting your course by a more excellent way to live the uncommon way. You see, even the brothers uh, trying to manipulate here, coming up with the story that their, their father gave this direction before he died. What a contrast they try by their efforts of their own manipulation to seek forgiveness. Rather than choosing God's way, they didn't know Joseph's heart. But Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to show them a greater way. In fact, he showed them a great truth. Notice 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and even if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. That is a bold statement. He is, he's proclaiming there that love is what makes you something. 
Love is what brings substance to the living. You want to live well? There is a more excellent way. God is love. Without love, I am nothing. Love, the substance of love is what makes you something, he says. And then we see this in the story, that those who live well have a sensitive heart. Would you notice this part in verse 17 where it says that Joseph wept when they asked this forgiveness. He was stirred because of compassion for when they asked this forgiveness. You know, if you read through the story of Joseph, you know that Joseph wept many times. It makes us respect him even more when you see how tender and sensitive his heart was. People that are sensitive to the people around them have compassion and they care and they hurt. When others hurt, they hurt. And it makes their heart then compelled. They're sensitive to the heart hurts around them. When the famine became severe and the brothers first came to Egypt, they didn't recognize Joseph. Joseph recognized them. He even used an interpreter so they didn't know that he understood their language. Then later when Joseph held one of the brothers Simeon in prison until they would bring Benjamin. Benjamin is his closest brother. The brothers said to each other in Hebrew, we saw the distress of our brother when he pleaded with us when they betrayed him. We would not listen. Now comes reckoning for his blood. When Joseph heard these things, it says, he turned away and wept. Compassion for what they have endured. When his brothers brought Benjamin finally to Egypt, Joseph said, is this the boy you spoke of? God have mercy on you, my son. When he first met Benjamin, it says, he found a private place and he wept. Joseph then later set a trap so that Benjamin would have to stay in Egypt as his servant and the remaining brothers were free to leave. But Judah stepped up and said, please, sir, I will be your servant in place of the boy. Please let the boy go or it will bring the gray hairs of his father down to the grave. When, when, when Joseph heard Judah offering himself to be a servant in exchange for his brother Benjamin, it was too much. Joseph could control himself no more. He ordered the Egyptians out of the room and he wept so loudly it says that Pharaoh himself heard of it. When Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, he fell on jo uh, Benjamin's neck and just wept. He held each of his brothers, kissed them and wept. Such sensitive heart. It's good for a man to weep comes from a sensitive heart. Jesus wept. Remember when, when, when they said to him, Lazarus, is your, your friend is dead. And he came to the tomb. He says, Jesus wept, even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem because he proclaimed their destruction and it broke his heart. Jesus wept on the night in which he was betrayed. Jesus wept. You know, I, I got to use my, my, myself as an illustration. In the past, I used to hold my emotions and I didn't cry at all. My, my wife thought I was a bit too much like Spock. Well, I thought it was what men do. And I thought it would help me to live long and prosper. Let's see what I did there with that. But in my early 20s, I, I had this opportunity to, 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 to teach, preach. One of my first times I ever preached in a church. And, and it was so bad. I mean, it was bad. It was so bad. How bad was it? It was so bad that when I'm giving the speech, I'm having a conversation with myself while I'm giving the sermon. And the conversation to myself was, this is bad. This is really bad. And I couldn't give this, the, the message because I was like, this is really bad. And, and, and I just, I couldn't do it, you know. And so I actually stopped the message and I, I, I tried to make it spiritual. You know what I think we should do? I think we should get into little groups and pray. And, and so they did that and then we wrapped it up. And then when we were finished, uh, my wife was near the front. I grabbed her hand, brought her into a back room alone and just cried bald and just, I failed. 
Later, I, I, I went home, and uh, one of the old, respected men that was there called me, Paul. And he said, how, how are you doing? And I told him what happened. And, and he said, you know what? I'm glad you cried. Because it means it meant something to you. It means that it mattered to you. And I'm glad for that. You'll be all right. You'll be fine. You'll get better. So it really was bad then. When our daughter was murdered, I cried more than I ever cried in my life. More than I had ever known. And it's changed me. Since then, since our daughter died, I'm so easily brought to tears. It's always there. Someone once said to me, when do you get over it? And my response is always the same. Who says I want to? She's dear and dear. I, I, I know that one day we will hold each other again. But God has made me more sensitive to the hurts and the wounds of others. Sometimes people ask me to do a, a funeral and uh, someone asked me to do a funeral uh, for their daughter who died and, and I said, can we ask one of the other pastors? That's one thing I can't do very well. Amen. Joseph's tears came out of compassion and love. He could see the burden. They were, he, he could tell that they were burdened and he had a sensitive heart. To live well requires a sensitive heart. To live well in this earth requires a compassion towards those around you. What is the opposite of a, of a compassionate, sensitive heart? What's the, what's the opposite? Hard heart. A hard heart feels nothing for those around them. And a hard heart feels nothing for God. See, those who are compassionate toward God are compassionate toward others. A sensitive heart toward God is a sensitive heart toward others. Nehemiah 9 verse 17 says, speaking of hard hearts, they refused to listen and, and did not remember God, your wondrous deeds which you performed among them. So they became stubborn and they appointed the leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But God, you are a God of, com of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. That's the way of God, compassionate, forgiving, abounding in love. Those who are sensitive are like that. Joseph's heart was sensitive to God and was sensitive to others. You see, he, he was sensitive to God in the story of his life. Here's an example. When Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, his answer was this. How could I do this thing and sin against my God? His heart was sensitive to his Lord. And he delighted in the relationship that he had with God so much that he wanted nothing to interfere with this love that he had with God. And so he said, how can I do this thing that would, that would sin against my God and offend my God and, and harm this relationship? I, I, no, I cannot do this thing because of what I have with my God. This is the key to living well. I cannot do this thing because of what I have with my God. To live well is to seek God's then perspective as your own. When Joseph's brothers fell down and they said, behold, we're your servants, he said, am I in the place of God? Don't be afraid. 
yes, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. See, God had a perspective, and he took God's perspective as his own. He chose to see the circumstance of the whole thing as God saw it. God was doing something greater than even you had understood. And he took God's perspective. See, he never gave up. Throughout the course, Joseph had this dream that one day he would be given this place of position and authority. God gave him this dream and he took it as a promise. But then one bad thing after another, his own brothers betrayed him? Like, can you imagine there in that pit? They took a hold of him, you know, threw him in a pit waiting for slave traders to come. And the, can you imagine in that pit, like, God, what happened to the dream? What happened to the vision? What about that great vision you gave me? What, now I'm in a pit. And then, the, and then the Midian traders come along and they sell him and then he's sold it into, now he's in Egypt being sold, you know. Just, what, what happened to the vision, God? There's a lot of people who would have given up on God. Well, so much for your great vision. Many people would have done this. And then, you know, but he's faithful and, and, and he's holding on to his integrity, his faith, his character, unrelenting steadfastness. He's living well. And then he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He refuses to give in to her, her, her seductions. And so she falsely accuses him and Potiphar throws him in, in prison. Now he's in prison. Couldn't he have had the same attitude? Well, what about that vision, God? What about all you promised me? Many people would have given up on God. But not Joseph. Steadfast, I will not relent, I will not give up, I will not let go of my integrity, I will not let go of my faith, I will not let go of what God promised me, I will not let go. This is a great, this is a great example. I will not let go. And there in the prison, again, the favor of God is being seen as he's, he's gaining favor of the, uh, you know, the, the jailer and, and then he's helping his friends there in the prison with interpreting their dreams. And then one day, Potiphar has this dream, twice. And then one of those prisoners re relates to, to, to the Pharaoh, I know a man, I know a man who interpreted my dream and it came so. So they called Joseph who, uh, who gave the interpretation, there will be seven years of great abundance followed by seven years of famine. You must prepare now. And this is what you must do. So then Pharaoh said, who can we find wiser than Joseph? Implement this plan. And, and so he's given his position, his authority. And then when his brothers came seeking food at all, oh, I see it all now. But what if he would have given up? Here's my point. Never give up on God. Amen. Amen. Never give up on God. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Never give up. Take God's perspective. God has a, you cannot see. There's great comfort in this principle. There is so much evil in this world. There is, there are so many who have chosen the course of evil. Look around this world. There are so many who have chosen the course of evil. This world is filled with evil. Anybody agree with me? But as for you, and as for me, you can choose a different course. Choose a higher course. Know that God is sovereign over all. It requires looking beyond what we see with our eyes. Walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, verses 5 to 7. He who prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us his spirit as a guarantee, a pledge, so that we are always confident, 
For we walk by faith and not by sight. Joseph's father, there, when the famine hit, and then the brothers went to go and to, to seek grain, only to have Simeon held back until Benjamin could be sent. He thought everything was against him. It's a time of famine. I sent my, my, my sons to go get grain, and now I've lost my son Simeon, and he insists this man, whoever this man is, insists on my son Benjamin being brought to him. I've already lost Joseph, and now I'm going to lose Benjamin? Everything's against me. Have you ever felt that way? Everything's against me. He couldn't see. And this is true for many people. They can't see. Everything's against me. He couldn't see that God was orchestrating everything and that God was working all things together for good. And those things that he thought were against him were the very things that God would use to be for him. This is so important. The very things that you think are against you can often be the very things that God can use to be for you. Now this is so important. People can be against you. Things can be against you. Never give up on God. God can use those very things to be for you. I have seen it over and over and over. I wish I could tell you all the stories. I have seen it over and over and over. Someone was once hard against me. But I knew this principle. I knew this principle well. Because I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. I knew this principle well. What do you do? Someone's hard against you. I will not be hard against them. I will hold on to my integrity. I will walk in grace. I will walk in compassion. I'll speak truth in love. And I know that my God will use even that for his glory. Amen. And he did. I wish I could tell you the story. And he did. Someone who was watching this whole thing unfold. Why didn't you respond to that? Why didn't you respond to that? Because I know my God, and I know that he'll use it. I will, I will absolutely believe that God will use it, and he did. It will work to my favor. You watch, God will work it to my favor. If I hold on to my integrity, if I watch, if I believe the way of God, it will work to my favor. You watch, I know my God. Amen? You watch, you watch. It's trusting God's perspective. We, 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 we may not be able to see, we often can't see what God sees. It's enough for us to know that God does see and that God works all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What God is doing is according to a purpose. Don't give up on God. Don't judge God's love by your outward circumstances. This is one of the great life lessons. Don't judge God's love based on your outward circumstances. Jacob thought everything's against him. No, God is showing you through this, even through this trouble, a great blessing. Just wait and see. Joseph 
could have given up on God. God, you say you love me, you say you love me, you gave me a vision, and look at all the things that I've been through in my life. Look at all these troubles I went through in my life. You say you love me, this is how you show love? Many people do this. Many people do this. And it's a great error in life. Please, I want to say to you, please don't make this error. Because you'll miss out. When you give up on God, you're going to miss out. Don't, make, don't give up on God. Don't judge God's love by outward circumstances because you have no idea. Jeremiah wrote this in Lamentations 3, verses 21 and 26. Jeremiah wrote this when the Babylonian army was in the midst of destroying Jerusalem. And he wrote these words in their, in their, in their day of great darkness, a day of great trouble. He wrote this in Lamentations 3. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. See, this is the key, isn't it? If you know God's way, you will recall it to your mind. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. That the Lord's loving kindnesses, indeed, they never cease. Do not judge God's love by outward circumstances. Indeed, the Lord's loving kindnesses never cease. For his compassions, they fail not. And then he wrote, For they are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. They are new. Your compassions are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait. Wait for him. To the one who seeks him. It's good to wait silently for the salvation of the Lord. Wait. Do not give up. For his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. New every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Amen. Amen. Sure, let's give the Lord praise. But then there's this, see what God would do through you. See, your life will not be remembered for what you did for yourself. Your life will be remembered for what you did for others around you. Sensitive heart sees people around them, has compassion for the people around them, concern for the people around them. You will not be remembered for what you did for yourself. Can you imagine living your life? Let's say that you have resources to do it. Can you imagine living your life and pampering yourself all along the way? There's nothing in my life that compels me to pamper myself all along the way. You will be remembered for what you did for others and for the kingdom of God. Joseph said, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you. I'll provide for your little ones, even the next generation. This is a fulfillment. His father spoke a word of prophecy over him that Joseph would be a fruitful bough by a spring whose branches run over a wall. <laughs> a fruitful bough Joseph will be whose branches run over a wall. It's another secret to finish well. That which God would do through you. A fruitful bough 
The key to bearing fruit is to be grafted into the tree of life. God's sap, God's life moving through you is what gives your life significance and power. Joseph, the key to his victory was the relationship that he had with the Almighty. I want nothing to interfere with what I have in God. It's, it's beautiful to me. It's wonderful to me. I want nothing to interfere with what I have in God. That is the key to bearing fruit. Plant, uh, Psalms 92, verses 13 to 14. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish there in the courts of our God. And they will still yield fruit in their old age, full of sap and very green. The older I get, the more I love that verse. Full of sap. Yes, Lord, make me sappy. And very green. Believe in God. And believe that God would do great things. It's what God does through you. I was thinking of an illustration. Maybe some of you remember the movie Count of Monte Cristo. Anybody see this movie? It's, I'll quote it anyway, even though I see some of you didn't see it. In the movie Count of Monte Cristo, the injured and weak Abbe Faria, old man, tells young Edmond Dantes from the barren prison where to find the vast treasure of Sparta. And then he says that when Edmund finds the treasure of Sparta, one day when he gets out of the prison, use it for good, only good. No, says Dantes. No, I will surely use it for my revenge. Abbe Faria, breathing his last, then says, Here, here now is your last lesson. Do not commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. He was wrongly accused. God has said, Vengeance is mine, Abbe Faria says. God says that he will repay. I don't believe in God, says Dantes. It doesn't matter, says Faria. He believes in you. At the end, Dantes stands on the island that was once his prison, and he says, you were right, priest. You were right. This I promise to you and to God. That which I once used for vengeance, I will now use for good. So rest in peace, my friend. Rest in peace. Love that line. Rest in peace. And lastly, we'll close with this. Believe that God will surely take care Verse 24, Joseph is about to die. God will take care of you and will bring you up from this land and bring you to that land which he promised. And when he does, promise me, do not leave my bones here in this land. Take my bones and bury me in Israel. God would fulfill his promise that God would bring them home and when you do, you take me home with you. It's a great truth. God will take care of you, and God will bring you home. That much is sure. We're all on a long journey home, but we know where home is, and we will be planted there in the courts of the Lord. Amen. Lord, we love you and thank you. for such great, wonderful truths. When we come to the end, 
May we say, God, that we fought the good fight. We finished the course, kept the faith. We lived well to the glory of God. Never giving up. Not judging God's love by the outward circumstance. Holding on to integrity. Holding on to faith. Holding on to that beautiful relationship that God gives through his son Jesus Christ. Want to live well? Then walk well in the nearness of God and in the course that he lets, sets before you. Church, how many would say to the Lord, I want to live my life well. I want to live my life to your glory. I want to, I want to live well. I want to finish well. I want to abide in the presence of the Almighty. I want to walk on this journey, on this long journey home. I want to walk it with you. I want to live well to your glory. Would you raise your hand if that's you? You want to make that declaration to the Lord. I want to just declare it. I want to just say it, God. I want to live to your glory. Lord, we love you and thank you for everyone who is stirred of the Spirit. We give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, and yeah, let's give him praise. Amen. 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 Amen.